I want to talk to you today about a topic that we usually don't like talking about. That topic is the unknown. The unknown is always just around the corner. It's behind that door that we didn't open. And the problem with the unknown is that once we opened that door and that tentacle monster got us, we can't go back. It's in the past. It's done. And so we don't like thinking about the unknown. At least most of us don't. But as scientists, that's our job. Our job is to think about the unknown. It's to carve out a piece of that unknown and turn it into the known. And so we ask ourselves, well, what can science tell us about the unknown? Well, back in Victorian times, we thought the, the picture is pretty simple. There's true, there's false. Some statements are true, some statements are false. And given enough time, we'll find out what's true and what's false. We know that that's not the case anymore. The picture is way more complicated. So there are things that we know as true. There are things that we know as false. But there are also statements that are just decidably true or decidably false. What does that mean? Well, something is decidable if we have a good procedure of finding out whether it's true or of finding out whether it's false. And sometimes things are just one-sided. So if I want to tell you I have a sister, that's easy to prove. I would just bring her with me on the stage and you'd see. But to prove that I don't have a sister is kind of tricky. Similarly, sometimes there are even tougher statements, statements that are only provable. There's no good procedure. You just have to be brilliant to find out whether they're true or not. An example of that was Fermat's last theorem, which took 200 and some years to prove the best mathematical minds in the world slaved on it. And eventually, we know it's true, but it required brilliance. And what we know now is that outside that is the great unknown. There are those things that are not only unknown, but unknowable, statements that we'll never be able to prove true or false. And as scientists, we care about that little spot in there. We care about those problems that are decidable, that we can actually do an experiment and find out, is this true or is this false? And not only that, we have another job when we carve out that piece of the unknown. And that job is to figure out whether this is an important unknown. So what's in my pocket? That's probably not an important unknown. I'm not Bilbo Baggins. The fate of Middle Earth doesn't depend on it. <laughs> um, that's an example of an unimportant unknown. So how do we make our robots handle the unknown better? That's, that's the sort of problem I work on. So classical robots were designed for the manufacturing floor. They're designed for building things. It's a very known environment. And the attitude for handling the unknown is artificial intelligence or machine learning. And those are hard problems. Um, so I went ahead and I tried to look at what happens when robots actually encounter the unknown. And this is one of, a picture taken by one of the most amazing robots ever built, the Mars rover Opportunity. And it is of the Burns Cliff on Mars. We didn't even expect to see this cliff. Opportunity worked way longer than anyone expected. It was really an amazing robot. Um, and it also probably missed one of the greatest scientific opportunities ever, because these cliffs look like the sort of cliffs that have fossils on Earth. And if Opportunity was a robot that could climb, we might know whether there's life on Mars now. But no one expected opportunity to survive that long. No one expected it to need to climb. So in our lifetime, we'll probably never know if there are fossils in the Burns Cliffs. Here's another example. When you see a situation like this, you really want to send a search and rescue robot. right? You want a robot that will help us find survivors. Um, but in this well-known tsunami disaster in Japan, when we sent out people, we found out that the real problem is a nuclear disaster. Only they were already there. The gear was already packed. They couldn't change and now have a robot that will work in high radiation in a nuclear reactor. So you see the recurring theme here? The recurring theme is that we often find out what we need to do after we're already there. That gave me an idea for defining a piece of the unknown that we can carve out and actually work out that is tractable, that is simple enough for us to solve it yet somehow encapsulates this notion of unknown. And that's the unknown challenge mission. Now, the unknown challenge mission is basically this simple kind of problem. We send our robot out to perform one task. But that task is from a list of tasks that we know are feasible for robots. We know that robots can do them. 
only we don't know which of the tasks we'll need to do before we deploy the robot. So the challenge is not doing the things. We know we can do these things. The challenge is that which task we need to do is unknown. And if we build a robot that can do many things, well, that makes the robot complex, heavy, expensive, eventually unreliable or impossible to build. So I take a bio-inspired approach. I do bio-inspired robotics. I try and look at animals and learn from them about ideas on how to build my robots. And I know that intelligence and adaptability are properties of the whole body, not just of the mind. But the thing is, the bodies are the part that's hard to adapt. Matter is a lot harder to change around than software. So what sort of body can handle the unknown best? Let's, let's look at this problem from the context of building a body. So let's take a simple case. We want a robot that can move well on water, on land, and in air. After all, we know how to build boats. We know how to build cars. We know how to build helicopters. We even know how to build car boats and seaplanes. Only that, that thing that would be in the question mark corner would be pretty ungainly, right? It would be sort of the amalgam of these two things. Um, so maybe we can do that differently. And here's the idea we came up with. So this is called SealPack. I built it with some colleagues in the University of Pennsylvania. And what you see is SealPack being assembled into one of three different configurations in about five minutes. But it can become a boat, a quadcopter, or a car. And that's a pretty good quadcopter, as quadcopters go. It's a pretty good car, as cars go. And it's as good a boat as we could make with motors that weren't designed to work with water. And then we thought, well, that's kind of frustrating. We have a human in the loop here. That wouldn't work for Mars, right? So let's take the human out. Let's build a robot that can build other robots. And so what you see here is Foambot. It has these little mobile clusters that can crawl out of the mothership it also helped kind of shove them around. All of this is done under remote control. And then the mothership sprays a body that connects these actuators. So suddenly, we make a robot under remote control. In this case, we decided to make a quadruped. It's kind of creepy. I'm sorry. Maybe there's, maybe there's a recurring theme here. I do creepy robotics. Um, but we can also decide to build another creepy robot out of the same components. And this is a snake robot. So same mothership. Same modules crawl out. We link them with the body. And this foam, by the way, is foam anyone if you could buy. This is just the foam you use for sealing your, your house thermally. And, and now this, this robot can crawl. <laughs> I mean, it's sped up, you know, it's, it's, it's sped up. But this, this robot can crawl. Um, And it, it can even do this. It can sidewind. And you know, when we figured that out and we ran it towards one of the students, it kind of jumped back because it was so snake-like and, and startling. Um, so then we thought, well, maybe we could do something else. And that is, if we are going to have the human in the loop, if we're thinking about that Japanese tsunami scenario, what if we put in that van a simple manufacturing system the sort of thing that, that you know, any, any kind of maker shop has, like a simple laser cutter and some basic materials for rapid manufacturing. And we encapsulated all the complexity in the robot in a few modules that have the electronics. And then, when they get out to the field, they can build the robot they need. They can build it to the task. And they can evolve those designs quickly when they see something isn't working until they can get a body that works for the problem that they need to solve, because it's the body problem that's harder. And so what you see here are several iterations of the Big Ant robot that I built here in Michigan. And this is Big Ant walking around. The robot you see here, this robot, is iteration 40, 40 of Big Ant. Now, typically, when we build robots, we don't have that many design iterations. But it's so easy. It's so cheap. It's $20 to build the chassis of this robot. The electronics, of course, are much trickier. But the chassis itself, which is what we design and iterate through, is very quick and easy to build. And so I want, I want to leave you with this thought. The unknown, the unknowable, those are a quintessential property of life. They're here to stay. We can't get rid of them, even if we don't like thinking about them. We can't prepare for everything that might happen. What we can do is we can build up our core skills, our competency. We can have some courage. And then we go out there 
And what we need to do is solve the problems we find after we know what they are. Thank you very much.